Nickelodeon used to show some strange commercials, to say the least. I remember seeing this ad for the SpongeBob episode, Have You Seen This Snail?, where there was this flashlight shining through a black screen with SpongeBob faintly screaming Gary's name in the background. There was another one where a freaky puppet tried to fight some kid for his waffles. But I remember this one in particular because it made something of an impact on me. This family would ask a guy to time them, then they'd rush through their morning routine at lightning speed. One of the kids would then say Nick.com, to which the guy would reply, Oh. Then it would cut to footage from a game completely unrelated to the commercial itself. For some reason, this was how Nickelodeon advertised its website back in 2004. Commercials like this aired a few times, with the games at the end being different, but I'll never forget what it showed the first time I saw it. It was a 3D platforming game called SpongeBob SquarePants Obstacle Odyssey. It only showed less than 10 seconds of it, but it had my child self hooked. As soon as I saw it, I wanted to play it more than anything in the world. I was a big fan of the AWE game, so any SpongeBob computer game was a must for me. So what exactly was Obstacle Odyssey? Well, in the early 2000s, Nick.com released a series of games that could be downloaded under the label Nick Arcade, not to be confused with the TV show of the same name. Seriously, good luck trying to look this up. Of these games, Obstacle Odyssey drew me in the most. It was created by a very small company called snap to play a medium-sized company called Retro64, and a massive one called Big Fish. Retro64 has a respectable catalog of games, and Big Fish is mostly a publisher and distributor for games made by smaller companies. snap to play made a few children's games and dropped off the face of the earth, but let's check in on Big Fish and see what we can learn about it. It has been accused of knowingly deceiving customers into signing up for monthly services without informed consent. It was also the subject of a class action lawsuit over its app Big Fish Casino after a federal appeals court ruled that it constituted illegal online gambling. Wow. Imagine that being one of the first things written on your Wikipedia page. Its website is very similar to Wild Tangent, showing all of its games with free trials and purchase options. Just like with Wild Tangent, a lot of the modern ones are strange puzzle games as opposed to the more colorful titles they used to have. I wonder what it is about game service companies that causes stuff like this to happen. snap to play and Retro64 would later go on to create LEGO BuilderBots, which saw some moderate success. snap to play would also go on to make SpongeBob Diner Dash, but Obstacle Odyssey was one of their first big projects. So let's take a look at it and see if it lives up to my child self's expectations. I just have one thing to say before we begin. Nick.com. You better have said oh. Starting the game up, we're immediately hit with, whoa. <laughs> you guys all right there? What's going on with Patrick? At least your cursor is a realistic fish head, which is a nice little detail. The music also sets the mood pretty well. You can choose any of the three worlds in the game, then you can choose any fifth level to play if you don't want to start from the beginning. I'm not sure why the system works like this, but I'll accept it. There are no on-screen instructions, so I had no idea what these numbers meant when I first booted it up. I ended up playing the fifth stage first. Starting with the Bikini Bottom world, you move across these platforms to reach Patrick at the end and collect bubbles for bonus points. If you aren't playing for a high score, you can ignore them entirely. You move by either using the keyboard or the mouse to steer Spongebob the way you want to go. I found that it's good to switch it up for certain stages. The mouse gives you a little more control over where you land and the direction you go in. It's also far more responsive than the spacebar, which doesn't always register when you press it to make Spongebob jump. After every four stages, you get a silly cutscene followed by a minigame where you play as Sandy, Mr. Crab, Squidward, or Patrick. You collect some item relevant to the character, and yes, all four of them are equally mortifying. Like, look at Squidward! Oh my gosh, what's wrong with him? Look at him go! Some of the stages can get really creative, but some have a tendency to induce our inner rage demons. Whenever I reach a hard level, I'll encounter this phenomenon where I'll do really good, make a mistake, and fail, then I can't do as good as I did before. This happens in a lot of games, I'm sure there's a scientific reason for it. 
I really like stages like this ramp one, and I respect this one that actually prevents you from jumping for the entire level. This one is called Silly Sombreros, but they're not actually very silly. Or sombreros. Every stage is timed, so you have to hurry up and complete it, but the timer only becomes a concern if you care about collecting the bubbles. You'll likely fall to your death before you run out of time. Here's one thing I don't like, though. When you die enough times, the game is over and will delete your progress. I understand this was part of a series called Nick Arcade, and it might have wanted to replicate the feel of playing in an arcade, but it does kind of suck sometimes. Of course, you can play every fifth level whenever you want to, but I feel like I can't properly hone my skills on the harder levels if it won't let me play them endlessly. But if you can't win one world, you might as well check out the others. In Jellyfish Fields, the checkerboards are more greenish and the music is different. There are also giant jellyfish in the background. The bubble wasn't worth it! The other world is called the Blue Abyss, which is definitely a location I'd like to see in the show. I don't know where in the world this is supposed to be, but it looks really cool. Maybe it's what you see on your way to the Abyssal Plane. One thing I'd like to note is that the stages are very inconsistently difficult. They don't get harder as you go. Some of them are extremely difficult and others are as easy as just going for a couple jumps. I still can't figure out this ramp level. It's entirely random if I'm able to beat it or not. When you finally beat a world, you get this image of four scary monsters, I mean the Spongebob cast, as they celebrate your victory. I guess Mr. Krabs didn't care to show up. Typical Clancy Brown behavior. All there's left to do is check out the Hall of Fame. Wow, I didn't know I was competing with the Spongebob characters all this time. And that about does it. To be honest, it's basically what it says on the box. It's a basic Spongebob platformer. Some levels are hard, some are easy, and it's mostly straightforward. It can even be a little addicting. Overall, not bad. Just a really simple game. But I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. What if I told you this game isn't what it seems? That's right, this cute little Spongebob platformer carries a dark, dirty little secret. That's right, this game is a complete reskin of another Retro 64 game called Best Friends Forever, also known as Best Friends. You're trying to unite these duck guys named Petey and Patty by moving who I think is Petey through a series of obstacles. Legend says these two are best friends. It's the exact same game with different music, graphics, and a squeaky voice that talks to you the whole time. Since Retro 64 worked on both games, it isn't exactly a rip-off, but it definitely makes Obstacle Odyssey feel a lot less original. <laughs> but would you believe the story doesn't end there? You didn't seriously think this would be just a simple Spongebob jumping game without any extensive lore, did you? Nope. This game actually has a sequel. And it has a story. How's that for surreal? They made a game, reskinned the game, and then made a sequel to the reskin. But you want to know something else? Guess where you can go to play it? That's right, Wild Tangent. Is this a crossover episode? Now this game comes with a tutorial stage, and in this one you can actually play as more than one character outside the bonus rounds. Patrick, Sandy, and Mr. Krabs are playable, but this time Squidward got left out. I guess they found his model too janky in the first one. Sandy can double jump, Mr. Krabs is fast, and Patrick can't be affected by obstacles that push you. You can switch characters in any stage. And in case you were wondering, yes, they went through the trouble of adding Mr. Krabs' footstep sound effects whenever he moves. I really appreciate that. More on these characters later. 
The story is told through these comic panels, and it's actually kind of interesting. Reminds me of the comics I used to read in those old Nickelodeon magazines. Maybe I'll cover those someday. To steal the Krabby Patty secret formula, Plankton creates a time machine to send SpongeBob and his friends back in time. So they're all sent to different periods in history. SpongeBob grabs the time machine remote before jumping in so he can control wherever he goes to find everyone else. There's also this running joke where Patrick really likes Chum, and believe it or not, this is actually accurate. Unlike the last one, this game has a level select feature. You go to this screen whenever you finish a stage, then you click on the one you want to play. Then you hit the go button on the time machine. Now it doesn't sound so bad, but a lot of the levels are very straightforward, so it doesn't take very long to complete them. It can be annoying having to constantly go to this screen when you just want to play through the stages. Unless you're collecting the bubbles, a lot of the levels are just a matter of walking to the exit. In some stages, the only real conflict comes in when you try to get the bubbles. There's no real reason to unless you want a high score, so I'm not sure why the developers made so much of the game revolve around it. Sometimes when you fall over a ledge, the game will be nice to you and bring you back where you left off. I actually like this feature. It spared me from a few rages on occasion. In case you couldn't tell, the stages are supposed to resemble different periods in time. I like that they tried their best to make these small platforms look different, but honestly, I don't even notice any of the details while I'm playing. I respect it, but the gist of every obstacle course is basically the same. Also, I've had a few encounters with glitches in this one. Sometimes the vortex you need to enter to win the stage just doesn't appear. I keep wondering if I'm doing something wrong, but no, the game is just messing up. One neat feature is that the game lets you switch between the three time periods as you wish to. Sandy's in prehistoric times, Krabs is in the Middle Ages, and Patrick is in the future. I absolutely love how the future stages are made entirely of chrome. I know I said I don't really notice the visuals while playing, but I really appreciate this commitment to the show's continuity. Whenever you complete a world, you unlock the friend from that time period, then you can play as them. To be honest, you only ever need Sandy. Her double jump is extremely useful and sometimes overpowered. Mr. Krabs might be good for time saving, but you have absolutely no reason to ever play as Patrick. He moves way too slowly and his advantage is essentially meaningless because Sandy can just double jump over any obstacle. I feel like he's only there out of necessity. I guess Patrick fans can relish in playing as their favorite character. Another unfortunate thing about this game is the fact that many of the stages are just ripped from the first one. Or should I say, they're ripped from best friends. These developers weren't exactly known for their originality, were they? Oh god, not this one again. Once you save everyone, you get a false ending, then you unlock a bunch of bonus stages. Like with everything else, their difficulty is inconsistent, and with Sandy, most of them are fairly easy. When you beat them, you get the formula back, then Patrick uses the time machine to infinitely eat Plankton's chum. That's about it. So that concludes the Spongebob version of Best Friends and the Spongebob version of Best Friends with some extra levels thrown in. Overall, I have very mixed opinions. As basic platformers, they aren't that bad, but they aren't really groundbreaking either. The lack of originality is also really disappointing. You play this game as a kid, maybe you enjoy it, then you grow up and find out you've been lied to. It's basically the video game equivalent of Santa Claus. I respect the features that were true to the actual show, but I don't think much thought went into the graphics themselves. The games might have made some money at the time, but I don't think they'd withstand the test of time. For the most part, the first game is what you'd expect it to be, but I'm not sure if a whole sequel to it was necessary. Overall, the games might be good boredom killers, but if you're looking for a good Spongebob game, there are many, many more fish in the sea. All I have to say is... Nick.com. You better have said it this time. Thank you for joining me. I will see you in the next memory.